And this brings me to my last point that I just want to finish on is because the reason why people ask these questions is because they're really trying to ask the question, is my baptism valid? Uh, is my baptism valid? That's a question that people ask because they want to make sure, and, and, and they have the right motive, because they want to make sure that they're baptized scripturally and that they are in obedience to God and to his word. Now, what makes a baptism valid? Now, in my opinion, from going through the scriptures that we've gone through, because baptism represents the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what I believe makes a baptism valid is that you are saved, so you have been baptized by the Holy Ghost and added to the body of Christ. And because it represents that barrier with his death, you need to be baptized by immersion and not by sprinkling. And I think those are the only two things that make a baptism valid. Now, there are other things that I would do according to my own convictions of how I would perform a baptism, who would perform a baptism, who I would want baptizing me, but those things do not invalidate a baptism. Why? Now, a valid baptism, I believe, is only if you're saved and you're immersed in water because your baptism with water should not be validated by who baptizes you. Because, number one, you can't even prove... Let's say you want a believer to baptize you and um, you, know, you, you think a baptism is invalid if, if an unsaved person baptizes you. Well, how can you even prove that? You know, because you can't prove somebody else's salvation. Only they know and only God knows. So if you're basing the validity of your baptism with water on another person's salvation, there's no way you could even prove that to yourself. And what if you get baptized and then 30 years later you find out they're not saved? Does that mean, should you get baptized again? No, I'm not going to stop you if you want to get baptized again. But um, I don't think it invalidates your baptism because I think your validity of your baptism is between you and God. And if you are saved, if you have been immersed, I believe you have obeyed God in baptism. So, you know, number one, how can you prove that they're saved? What if somebody believes that they need to be an ordained person of God? Well, how can you even prove that they were legitimately ordained? Because personally, I believe legitimate ordination is from top down. When one bishop lays their hand on another bishop and ordains that person and appoints them. I, I believe that if a church votes a bishop into power, I don't believe that they're technically ordained. I, I believe they're only ordained if another bishop lays their hand. Now, if the church chooses them and then a bishop lays their hands on them and makes his decision based on the church vote, I, the, I would take that as a, a legitimate ordination. But I don't believe ordination is you know, just a bunch of believers choosing one other person to um, be their authority o over them. I think it has to come top down. Um, and people might say, well, what if there isn't somebody to set that person in place? I just don't believe that would be the case. I don't believe God would just not have nobody that, you know, you know, wants to ordain people, wants to plant churches in other places. I believe God is using his people that believe the right thing and to, to plant those churches. And either those people have to move or they just have to wait until a Bible-believing preacher comes to that area to baptize and set things in order uh, that are wanting in that city, as Paul had done to Titus. Um, or they'll say, for example, well, you know, it needs to be somebody who's saved, but they need to be baptized by somebody who's saved, baptized by somebody who's saved or who was ordained legitimately. And they have this lineage of ordination or they have this lineage of salvation. If your baptism is valid based on who baptizes you, how could you even prove that spiritual lineage? I mean, how far are you going to go back in this spiritual genealogy to prove that you were baptized by somebody who was baptized who was saved, who was baptized by somebody who was saved, who was baptized by somebody who was saved? So what if somebody along that line was not saved? Does that mean everyone along that line is now no longer baptized? So you see how it just becomes silly if validity is based on who the person baptizing you is? But, you know, even though all these things don't invalidate baptism, I would ask the question to those people that want to go against scriptural example is, you know, why would I, why would I want to be baptized contrary to what I see in the Bible? I mean, to me, it, that's why I have that conviction. It's like if I can see in the Bible ordained men of God baptizing, saved person baptizing, baptism by immersion, why would I be, want to be baptized contrary to that, what I see in the Word of God? Because I want to obey God in my life. It's like with... Um, we talked about breaking of bread and we can make a lot of connections between the two because they're both all physical ordinances that represent something spiritual. But, you know, there are a lot of things about breaking of bread um, that are different preferences. For example, some people use, you know, crackers that they buy. Some people use like, you know, flat bread that they 
cut up. Uh, some people don't use unleavened bread or unleavened um, juice. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a sin because we're not commanded how we are to do um, the breaking of bread, but we are given a scriptural example of how we are to do it. And that's why in my own life, I try and do it as closely as possible as I read it in the New Testament. But you know, that's why I believe that we should tear the bread because it's the breaking of bread. And I believe that we should use unleavened bread and unleavened wine because it uh, leaven in the Bible represents sin. And because that physically represents the body and blood of Jesus, it should be without leaven, it should be without sin. So there's that sim symbolism there. So I believe, therefore, that you know, that's what it represents. So why would I want to be baptized contrary to that biblical example of what I see? But let me just finish on this point, because you know, the real issue is, you know, when we talk about validity of baptism, the real question is, you know, have you obeyed the Lord in being baptized with order and having that outward testimony? You know, because baptism is not about, you know, being approved in the eyes of other people. And the reason why it's become that is because churches put all these requirements and they make baptism the ticket to all these requirements that people are now asking the question, is my baptism valid? It, does somebody else think I'm baptized? Because it's, it's the ticket to something else. But think about it. If you removed all the perks of baptism, right? If you removed the church member list, if you removed the ability to be able to vote in churches that have voting, if you removed the, the baptism allowing you to take part in the breaking of bread, then the validity of baptism comes down to not proving your baptism to somebody else, but just proving your baptism to God, right? And do you have that good conscience? Remember, the, it's, it's an answer of a good conscience towards God, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. So when we talk about the validity of baptism, the real issue is, have you obeyed the Lord? And that's something for you to judge. That's not something for me to judge. And that's why I don't condemn people that have been baptized, maybe contrary to a scriptural example, that is not a commandment, because it's, it's not up to me to, to determine whether they've been scripturally baptized. If they have you know, other requirements or whatever, or they think it should be done a different way, you know, I do have the authority to you know, think, well, do I accept it as a valid baptism? So I may not accept it as a valid baptism. Um, but... I don't take that stance. I personally would prefer you to judge yourselves between God. Have you obeyed God in being baptized? You know, were you saved when you were baptized? Were you immersed by baptism? I don't think it's wise to base your decision on who baptized you um, because like I said, those are some things you can't control. So anyways, I hope you learned some things there, but that's really the crux of today's sermon is, you know, who should do the baptizing, when she should be baptizing, just answering those questions. But I really think at the end of the day, if we remove all the perks of baptism, it becomes a, a, a lot of these questions become a non-issue and it's really just down to your own obedience to God.